"'A good deal like looking at humanity,' he said. "'There is such a thing as getting so far above our fellow men "'that we see only one side of them.' "'Ah, how much better was this sort of talk "'than the chatter and gossip of the Tab and the Hugenkamp, "'than the Major's dissertations upon his everlasting circulars. "'My wife and I exchanged glances. "'Now, when I went up the Matterhorn,' Mr. Breed began, "'My dear,' interrupted his wife, "'I didn't know you ever went up the Matterhorn.' "'It—it it was five years ago,' said Mr. Breed hurriedly. "'I—I I didn't tell you. "'When I was on the other side, you know, it was rather dangerous. "'Well, as I was saying, it looked—oh, it didn't look at all like this.' "'A cloud floated overhead, "'throwing its great shadow over the field where we lay. "'The shadow passed over the mountain's brow "'and reappeared far below, a rapidly decreasing blot.' flying eastward over the golden green. My wife and I exchanged glances once more. Somehow, the shadow lingered over us all. As we went home, the breeds went side by side along the narrow path, and my wife and I walked together. "'Should you think,' she asked me, "'that a man would climb the Matterhorn the very first year he was married?' "'I don't know, my dear,' I answered evasively. "'This isn't the first year I have been married, not by a good many.' and I wouldn't climb it for a farm. You know what I mean, she said. I did. When we reached the boarding-house, Mr. Jacobus took me aside. You know, he began his discourse, my wife, she used to live in New York. I didn't know, but I said, yes. She says the numbers on the streets run criss-cross-like, thirty-fours on one side of the street and thirty-fives on to other. How's that? That's the invariable rule, I believe. Then, I say, these here new folk that you and your wife seem so mighty taken up with, do you know anything about em? I know nothing about the character of your boarders, Mr. Jacobus, I replied, conscious of some irritability. If I choose to associate with any of them... Just so, just so, broke in Jacobus. I hain't nothing to say against your sociability, but do you know them? Why, certainly not. I replied. Well, that was all I was asking ye. You see, when he come here to take the rooms, you wasn't here then, he told my wife that he lived in number 34 on his street. And yesterday, she told her that they lived at number 35. He said he lived in an apartment house. Now, there can't be no apartment house on two sides of the same street, can they? What street was it? I inquired wearily. 121st Street. Maybe, I replied, still more wearily. That's Harlem. Nobody knows what people will do in Harlem. I went up to my wife's room. Don't you think it's queer? she asked me. I think I'll have a talk with that young man tonight, I said, and see if he can give some account of himself. But, dear, my wife said gravely, she doesn't know whether they've had the measles or not. Why, great Scott, I exclaimed, they must have had them when they were children. "'Please don't be stupid,' said my wife. "'I meant their children.' After dinner that night, or rather after supper, for we had dinner in the middle of the day at Jacobus's, I walked down the long veranda to ask Breed, who was placidly smoking at the other end, to accompany me on a twilight stroll. Halfway down I met Major Halkett. "'That friend of yours,' he said, indicating the unconscious figure at the further end of the house, "'seems to be a queer sort of a dick.' He told me that he was out of business and just looking round for a chance to invest his capital. And I've been telling him what an everlasting big show he had to take stock in the Capital Line Trust Company. Starts next month, four million capital. I told you all about it. Oh, well, he says, let's wait and think about it. Wait, says I, the Capital Line Trust Company won't wait for you, my boy. This is letting you in on the ground floor, says I, and it's now or never. Oh, let it wait, says he. I don't know what's into the man. I don't know how well he knows his own business, Major, I said, as I started again for Breed's end of the veranda. But I was troubled none the less. The Major could not have influenced the sale of one share of stock in the Capital Line Company. But that stock was a great investment, a rare chance for a purchaser with a few thousand dollars. Perhaps it was no more remarkable that Breed should not invest than that I should not. And yet, it seemed to add one circumstance more 
to the other suspicious circumstances. When I went upstairs that evening, I found my wife putting her hair to bed. I don't know how I can better describe an operation familiar to every married man. I waited until the last tress was coiled up, and then I spoke. I've talked with Breed, I said, and I didn't have to catechize him. He seemed to feel that some sort of explanation was looked for, and he was very outspoken. You were right about the children. That is, I must have misunderstood him. There are only two. But the Matterhorn episode was simple enough. He didn't realize how dangerous it was until he had got so far into it that he couldn't back out. And he didn't tell her, because he left her here, you see, and under the circumstances. Left her here? cried my wife. I've been sitting with her the whole afternoon sewing, and she told me that he left her in Geneva, and came back and took her to Basel, and the baby was born there. Now I'm sure, dear, because I asked her. Perhaps I was mistaken when I thought he said she was on this side of the water, I suggested with bitter, biting irony. You poor dear, did I abuse you? said my wife. But do you know Mrs. Tabb said that she didn't know how many lumps of sugar he took in his coffee? Now that seems queer, doesn't it? It did. It was a small thing, but it looked queer. Very queer. Queer. 